Okay, so welcome to the sec sem second seminar for this semester, although this is the first to reinitiate what as the Austin Journal Club. So we're starting that back again, and my goal today is to introduce you to this semester's topic. It's the motivation for the topic actually started with our first semester in Dr. St. Rose, who was talking about trying to train lymphocytes to cancer cells. What she was training them to was the markers on the cell surface of the cancer cells. So I thought I would like to show a piece of primary, this is actually a review, a piece of scientific medical literature that would help us understand what markers on cancer cells are. So for the rest of the semester we would like to do this every couple of weeks and we would need a volunteer probably from the senior classes to start preparing for the next talk. That means you've got to find an article Probably will link you up with a faculty mentor so the mentor can help you evaluate realistic and interest in the article and help coach you through doing the talk. So the other thing, the reason that I took this particular session was that I wanted to show you maybe what you might want to do in a talk or maybe what you might not want to do depending on how well this goes. So um, I've given a large number of talks and I want to use this as kind of a model of what you would like to do. All right, so we have a portal set up. We would like to get PDFs of all the documentation that you're going to use. We will disseminate that to everybody. And we are right now live and broadcasting this to students in Chicago and students who may be prospective students here at Awesome. And, and we will have this archived at the same time. So if anybody wants to go back and look at this, if there's any need to, we'll be able to make that available to you too. OK, so today I'd like to present a talk on molecular markers and breast cancer as the model. And I'm going to go through a talk outline. The primary reference is here. Everybody should have had access to this and hopefully looked it over so that I'm not talking to an entirely naive. And I would recommend for you that by the time you get all of your materials together, try to organize your talk as a talk outline. So this is what I want to try to do, talk with you today. I want to um, show you um, this protocol from these kinds of seminars, number one. Then we want to talk about the science and the medicine. I want to give you the motivation for the subject of choice, give you some background materials. These are your background pieces of literature in cancer and cell markers. And then look at the background material appropriate for you to understand what the reference material is talking about. That background material is going to include a class of proteins called mutants. And then we'll get into the article itself, draw some conclusions from what we see in the article. And I did, in further researches of this particular subject, found a follow-up article which I found really exciting. I want to show you how current the information is relevant to the primary article. And if I had had enough time five minutes ago, I would have included the references at the end of this talk. But I played student and I'm behind schedule. So I'll have to, have to attend that a little bit later. Okay, so the motivations were Dr. St. Clair's talk, once again, trying to train lymphocytes. This is treatment to cancer cell markers. So if we can do that, we might be able to treat cancers by um, aggressively attacking markers on cancer cells. The other motivation is cancer diagnosis. This is the other use for cancer cell markers. And the diagnosis here is a patient history. The patient is a 25-year-old black woman. She has been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. That is metastatic, and it is in the liver. At 22 year old, this person detected a mass on the breast by palpitation, and the diagnosis through all the preliminary work indicated a stage one breast cancer. 
she underwent surgery, chemotherapy. Chemotherapy included a large number of chemo drugs. And it's kind of interesting as you research this kind of article, this reads like a biochemistry, medical biochemistry, and a medical cell biology course. Everything that we are touching or presenting to you is appropriate for the backgrounds of this material, so I'm going to gratify that. So the drugs are here. They do things like interpolate into DNA, cross-link DNA, affect cellular microtubules, and the last one is an estrogen receptor antagonist, trying to shut off cell proliferation. One year post-operative, you do a sur surveillance, and the surveillance was, quote, normal. That's a very, very, very good thing. One year, nine months, the patient presents with acute abdominal pain on the right side. Ultrasound and CT confirm three large masses, liver, possible ovary involvement. Um, further ultra and CT on chest, abdomen, and pelvis confirmed the masses. Biopsy confirms metastases of breast cancer cell tissues. This person is now diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. That's the highest stage known. Um, so the Diagnosis currently is chemotherapy with carboplantin. It's a DNA repair inhibiting enzyme. The surveillance here is unsuccessful. Either the tumor was so aggressive as the metastasis after one year that it developed three and a half centimeter masses, or the initial surveillance was not sensitive to those metastatic cells. Right, so this is the motivation for surveillance and diagnosis at the earliest level and the surveillance and diagnosis at the earliest level we want to pursue are the cell markers of cancer. So cancer cells in brief, a, a normal mass of tissues, we have an initiating event, an initiating is a mutation, and if that mutation confers an advantage to cell growth and proliferation to that cell, it will become the dominant clone. Once you have initiating events, if you get a tumor promoter environments, growth factors, then you will give the environment appropriate for that cell to proliferate. If it can outcompete all the other cells, it becomes a tumor mass. So abnormal growth, differentiation, and cell death are the things we want to be thinking about. For you, you're staying about the same size. Maybe your adipocytes are changing their, their densities. Mine are. Um, but you're in homeostasis, which means you have a balance between apoptosis, cell death, and cell proliferation. So cells are always dying. Cells are always re um, dividing to replace those. If you have the correct balance, you're healthy, you have a homeostasis. If you increase the amount of cell division and apoptosis stays normal, you can grow a tumor mass. If you decrease the amount of cell death and division stays normal, you have a tumor mass. If you have a combination of both, you have a very aggressive tumor, and that's the state that tumors wish to get to. To be a successful tumor, that's what you want to do. There are two flavors of tumors. We've had an initiating event, a promoting event. This tumor in the middle has not been able to escape the tissue that it exists in, and as long as that doesn't have any pathology associated with it, that's a benign tumor. You can live with benign tumors um, basal cell carcinomas are benign, non-carcinogenic tumors. You just need to remove. If cell mutations and allow is able to gain motility, escape its environment, and try to move to other tissues, you have a metastatic event. That is a malignant tumor. You want to treat this prior to that. If metastasis has happened, the problem has become very, very, very severe. So to metastasize, we're looking now at an epithelium metastasis. We have an epithelial cell layer, apical surface, a basal surface. There's a basal membrane, which is separating um, one tissue from another. We have a large number of normal cells. We've had an initiating event and a tumor growth, which is benign. Enough mutations later, all of a sudden, this one cell type starts to change in its morphology invades the basal membrane, invades the next tissue, recruits angiogenesis, jumps into circulation, and now circulate through the body until it finds another environment to grow another tumor. That's the thing we really want to stop, and a little bit later on we'll go through some of the 
large number of things that have to happen for an epithelial cell to get to that state of metastasis. It's an amazing how many barriers you have to break down in homeostasis to get to that level of metastasis. We know from lecture material here in cell biology and medical cell biology that there are a large number of critical cancer genes. So you have normal genes that have mutated, contribute to this cancer phenotype. Those are, you have proto-oncogenes. If you have a normal gene which is behaving normally, it can become a cancer gene, it's a proto-oncogene. Once it does become a cancer gene, it is an oncogene. So we're allowing the cancer transition to happen. In this particular single transduction cascade, this is a mitogen activated cascade. It's going through, going through a receptor tyrosine kinase. We are going to activate by mitogen binding a large number of cascade molecules, all the ones circled or squared in cancer genes. The RAS cancer gene, the MYC oncogene, the RB tumor suppressor. So the two cl classes of genes are gain of function oncogenes, loss of function tumor suppressor genes. In order to get to the metastatic state, you have to have mutated a large number of critical cancer genes. The good news is it takes a lot of spontaneous mutations to get there. The bad news is we live long enough to do it. The worst news for the young woman that she has a propensity to this and she has a disposition at a very early age to, to have a metastatic event. So in the cell biology version of the metabolic cycle, here are some of the single transduction cascades that are simultaneously going on in all of your cells. This is just some, and they all integrate. And once again, in the single transduction, you are interacting with extracellular matrix, growth factors, hormones, survival factors, cytokines, death factors, anti-growth factors, and they all integrate downstream signaling events. Some of the critical cancer genes that we have talked about in all of your coursework, once again, are molded in blue for this particular work of this particular article in this particular metastases. There are interesting signal transduction molecules which are molded in red. And so those are appropriate for this breast cancer metastasis. So cancer cells are genetically unstable and they become more unstable as they go. They accept and they promote more and more mutations to try to get to that aggressive cell growth phenotype. You need many mutations to get to the metastatic event, but it does happen. So due to all these mutations, we have very dramatic changes in cell phenotypes from the normal non-cancerous cells. The cells become transformed. They become from polarized cells, if you were a polarized cell, to an unpolarized cell and that unpolarized cell will eventually become long. Dramatic changes are due to very large changes in gene expression patterns. This is where we're going to get our markers from at the cell surface. Cell surface glycoprotein changes. When you see things in red in this talk, I'm usually indicating the background which was pertinent to the primary article. So these I'm, I'm focusing on information that's appropriate for this particular cell um, um, breast cancer. We can see changes in cell surface glycoproteins in their amount, in their location, and the degree of modification by glycosylation. All of those things can happen. Those cell surface glycoproteins are talking to the extracellular matrix. How does a tissue form a tissue? Cell surface proteins and, and sugars are going to talk to each other. If your liver cells and, and become a liver tissue, if you are a hepatic tissue and a liver cell, you would reject each other as a partner. In order for me to metabolize, I've got to break those interactions. That's one of the things that will happen. You see changes in cell signaling. You're going to start asking for cells to proliferate in absence of proliferation signals. Um, receptor pushing kinases in this example and growth factor behavior. Antisocial behavior means mobility, where I used to be immobile. Cytoskeleton has to change. Metastasis, I am able to get through cell barriers, get into circulatory systems, get to other places and invade other tissues. Okay, so cell surfaces. This is what we want to be thinking about for the cell marker in this study. Extracellular surface, everybody here knows it's the extracellular surface because you see the sugars. 
So we have sugars on proteins, glycoproteins. We have sugars on lipids, glycolipids. And we have sugars even that we secrete. So there'll be parts of proteins that are secreted, and that's important for this talk. Sugar biosynthesis starts in ER for N-linked. We'll continue in the Golgi for both O-linked and N-linked sugars. For this particular talk, we're interested in O-linked sugars. So the defect in the marker can be something in the protein, the gene, or something in the enzymes that are doing the glycosylation. So markers, these are cell markers, but these are normal cells. When you become a transformed phenotype, some of these cell surface proteins, sugars, are going to become different. Those differences are the markers that we're interested in to try to identify cancer cells. And we like to try to use those differences in diagnoses early, early, early in treatment as early as possible. So an ideal tumor marker is easy and inexpensive to measure. So in expense is a huge thing in trying to fight cancer biology. Easy is nice. All right? So for most tumor markers, what you have to do is go get a piece of tumor tissue and evaluate the tumor. So that means biopsy or surgery. Easy means do we have a serum? So we're going to show you we will have a serum marker. Something is secreted from the cancer cell, and we can detect that in the presence of everything else that is It is specific to the cancer cell and commonly, if not always, associated. There's a stoichiometric relationship. The more marker, the more cancer cells. That relationship we really want to see to evaluate therapies. Abnormal levels in clinical or diagnostic methods to reveal the presence. So you've got to have levels which are abnormal over normal to see that the marker is there. And they should be stable. If they go away too quick, you will have missed the marker, misdiagnosed the quantity. You want low levels, if possible, in healthy individuals. And it would be really nice if they were prognostic for a recurrence of the disease. Change in status with tumor status. If you have a tumor and you have high levels, if you maintain the tumor and regress the tumor, if the levels go down, that's also a wonderful use of the marker. And if they can be used to precede and predict reoccurrence before it happens, before you see a mass, that is preferable in terms of therapies. Okay, so in detection and therapies, this there is a real discrepancy between the effort between trying to identify markers and their use clinically. So it's going probably to be easier to find markers to detect than to use the markers clinically. If this is something different on the cell surface, why can't we go attack that difference deliver a therapy, and that's what the lymphocyte therapy is trying to do. But that's new, and you already see that that's successful for some cancers, and there's a lot of work yet to do for other cancers. There, to tell you whether this is recommended as a marker, there are all agencies of experts who will evaluate the scientific and clinical data to tell you whether this marker is indicated for breast cancer or indicated for ovarian cancer or whether it's just bunk. So every country that is actively researching has their own expert panels. In the United States, the National Cancer Institute has one for early detection research, and the FDA has a series of five criteria now for you to decide whether, for them to decide whether a marker is useful reliably for detection and possibly useful for, um, for clinical use. So these are kind of discussion bodies. This is an approval at the level of drug body. So they, you have to go through these evaluations in order to determine what the markers are useful. Much of the literature that's out there that's medically related, even this article calls the 500 articles relative to breast cancer markers in the last some number of years, many of them are low impact meaning small numbers, not such great science. You really wouldn't put a whole lot of weight. If you read all of them, then maybe you have some idea of whether a marker might be useful. So tumor markers include proteins, the prostate, 
cancer antigen, the PSA, that's probably the most ideal cancer marker that's available right now. It obeys many of the criteria we talked about in the first couple of slides. Carbohydrate, that's our marker. This is the CA, um, oh, actually this one is CA125 ovarian cancer marker. This is another marker we could use. Glycoproteins, that's our marker. That's a mucin. This is the CA15-3. That relies to an assay of an antibody. This name is not really the name of the mucin. It's the assay you use to look at the mucin. Oncophelatin antigens. So there's a cancer um, for colorectal, or a, a, a cancer antigen for colorectal and liver. Oncophelatin that tells you something about what's going on to these cells. When you transform and de-differentiate, very frequently these cells become more embryonic-like. That's how large the change in gene expression patterns are getting. So useful for that. Hormones, glucagon, telling you something about the, the status of the pancreas. Calcitonin, another hormone useful for looking at um, cancers. Receptors for breast. You're going to evaluate a breast cancer, whether you're estrogen, progesterone, or the HER2 new receptor, positive or negative. That's a primary line of diagnosis. Genetic markers, this means you've gone in and done DNA sequencing. Look for methylation, possibly. RNA molecules, even the prostate cancer has an RNA, which is released in the serum, which is useful for a diagnostic marker for prostate cancer. So there are things that are appropriate for the primary article. The primary article is going to be thinking about what's boxed in blue, a glycoprotein, and it's the glyco part of this, which is the important part in the biological marker. This also indicates that the glycoprotein is a glycoconjugate to other cells. It's part of the extracellular matrix. It's involved in cell-cell recognition. So cell-cell surface carbohydrates. Those of you who are working in introductory cell biology and cell biology right now know we have talked about sugar on the extracellular surface and the glycocalyx, the very, very rich glycosylated surface on epithelial cells on the apical surface, which protects the epithelial cells or lets other cells contact um, through the extracellular matrix. So these are the roles that have been indicated for um, cell surface carbohydrates, apoptosis, apoptosis, cell adhesion, signal transduction, has to involve all of those particular issues. So a little background on breast cancer. This is the most common cancer in women. At least 1.2 million cases are detected each year. That's up to around 10% of the women population. There are half a million deaths a year associated with breast cancer. The diagnoses are pal palpitation and imaging. Um, imaging is really pretty sophisticated these days. You can start with ultrasound, CT, that's um, tomography, that's going to be an x-ray source uh, tomography. Positron tomography, which is very useful, I'll show you an example of that as the follow-up article. X-ray, all of these are ionizing radiation and you can use them in a limited fashion. Too many doses of that kind of um, imaging can cause more damage than it actually will help. MRI is a magnetic resonant resonance. It's also very high um, resolution and it is a non-ionizing radiation. All of these are available. They're all expensive to do. Receptor diagnoses for this particular case: estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, or two receptor. This is a all of these are receptor tyrosine kinases. So think about that cascade when we're going through. Anymore, we have a number of monoclonal antibodies which we can use for diagnosis screening. What we're thinking about for this particular marker is a, is a monoclonal antibody analysis, ELISA analysis. The stages on diagnosis are 1, 2, and 3. The prognosis are very good for stage 1. They, get, they reduce towards stage 4, but this is a moving target. So how you evaluate the prognosis is what has happened five years previously. And we keep advancing the science and the medicine so quickly that you have to continually evaluate the diagnosis because there are treatments, there are new detection methods, and the prognosis will improve over time. 
Treatments are hormonal therapies, chemotherapies, and biological therapies that now means antibody, targeting tumors with antibody. And there are two biologics now that are approved for breast cancer. Um, surveillance after treatment for reoccurrence. If there is reoccurrence, we go back through the cycle. We change the treatment, we treat, we surveil. So the earlier you detect in surveillance, the earlier you can treat, the earlier you have a, a, a better chance of prognosis. So we're looking really for early surveillance, and that has to be the goal of playing around with tumor cell markers. So for epithelial cells, here's our favorite cartoon of an intestinal epithelial cell doing sugar transport. And for cell biology, there is a, it's a very polarized cell. It has an apical surface, lots of apical um, microvilli and vaginations to hang on to transporters and receptors. There is a basal surface. We're going to have a basal membrane, collagen molecules, and the basal surface will interact with a different surface. Usually apical is interacting with a lumen or the external environment. The basal surface may be interacting with the circulatory system, so in this case. The um, polarizability is due to a, a series of junctions at the cell level, the tight junctions formed by gap junction proteins, not allowing the apical surface glycoproteins to diffuse around to the basal lateral surface. There are also adherin junctions, which are associating with cell matrix proteins, some of which are involved in arresting motion or arresting cell growth, um, the cohedrons, and, and also the adherent junctions in the desmosomes are organizing um, cytoskeletal elements to make sure that the polarity is maintained in internal of the cell. So we have to keep all of that intact to have this polarized. The apical surface usually has a mucus barrier, the glycocalyx again, and the mucus barrier is made of mucins. There's the protein of this particular article. It's a family of proteins, and they come in two flavors. They come as a secretory protein. If you have mucus, you have the secretory mucins. We're not interested in those. Right? So if they're secretory, you know they went through the ER, glycosylated in the Golgi, secretory vesicle, exocytosed. The trans bilayer form, mucin 1, is the one that we want to be thinking about. It has a large ectodomain sitting outside, which is hugely glycosylated. That's why you have this glycocalyx. It has a trans bilayer domain, and it has a, a C terminal domain, which also sticks outside, which is glycosylated. But we're mostly, mostly thinking about the large ecto domain, all sorts of only glycosylation. Okay. Tight junctions have a link to the receptor tyrosine kinase HER2. Cell proliferation on, big on is bad, regulated on. And here is junction, talk to the extracellular matrix and cohedrons. Do I, do I recognize you and do I go self-self, I'm going to stick around, or do I decide to go do something else? So carcinoma cells are derived from epithelial cells, including the breast, the prostate, and the lung cancer. And to, to get to the transformed state, you have to lose this polarity. So you are a non-polar cell by the time you are a carcinogenic cell as an epithelial cell. So mucins, um, they can be secreted or integral membrane proteins. There are a large number of these. The only one we're really interested in today is mucin 1. Um, mucus is a soluble mucin plus organic, organic, inorganic salts. And these things protect, lubricate, and hydrate the external surfaces of epithelial cells in the lumen, lumen or folks exposed to um, the surfaces. The transmembrane form are found in the luminal tracts, so in the gastrointestinal system and in breast, um, in the duct cells, the lungs. So the transmembrane form has two subunits. It forms a dimer, and it has one of the subunits has these huge number of repeats of serines and threonines, of all things prolines. Serines and threonines, what's the functional group? Anybody? An alcohol, right? And we can you we can take that alcohol and make a glycosidic bond to it. That's where we're going to put our sugars in O-linked sugars. There's huge numbers of these. You can make huge numbers of glycosidic bonds in that domain. Okay. So they have very dense O-linked um, glycosylation, and they are involved in cell adhesion 
And if you're a cancer cell, D adhesion. The interesting thing about mu one that ex that ecto domain can be shed, and it can be shed as a function of proteases, and there is a biological role normally for that. So you can release the ecto domain into a serum. Not a lot of that happens, and the only amount that happens is related to the total amount of mu one that's in the membrane. The carboxy terminal peptide has been shown to in to interact with cell signaling kinases. This is important. Or malignancy. So the names that should sound familiar to you are SARC, epidermal growth factor receptor, HER2 again, estrogen receptor, and that downstream effector for many signal transduction cascades, um, PKC, protein kinase C. And so these are all proto oncogenes. Problems in any of these where we dysregulate cell signaling kinases can lead to an oncogenic phenotype. So a hallmark of cancer for the mucins is aberrant chem, um, glycosylation. If this is the core polypeptide per single mucin one molecule on one serine or threonine, if there are hundreds of these, this thing is highly glycosylated. For mucins isolated from um, in a cancer cell, a tumor cell, we see that the degree of glycosylation is hugely reduced. Thinking about this, and I'm going, well, if cell-cell interactions are all these hydrogen bonding interactions between sugar trees, if I have less sugar, I have less interaction, I have the ability to lose that contact with my neighboring cell. That's probably one of the mechanisms we're trying to release from a tissue, try to become global. So tumor mucins, the observation is we see a truncation of the only glycosylations in the tumor cell. So mucins and epithelial cell um, oncogenesis. So in epithelial cell oncogenesis, you see a disruption of polarity and cell-cell interactions. You see a proliferation. There is an upregulation of the expression of the mucins. So there are more of them, but there are less sugars. More of them and loss of polarity, tight junctions go away. The adherent junctions go away. All of a sudden, the mucins become distributed around the entire cell membrane. That allows the cell membrane plasticity, and it allows this uh, event called the EMT, the basal lateral membrane epithelial mesenchymal transition. I'm going to break through the basal membrane and start to go to the tissue below me. The mucins used to be on the apical surface, but now on the basal surface. They're going to go attack the basal membrane for a way to the capillaries. So the things involved are genes transcription. Um, the mucins are involved in blocking stress, apoptosis, and, necro and ne necrosis. So if you have these, you have, you have no cell death. And they attenuate um, the activation of cell death receptor pathways. So we have a link to apoptosis in the mucins. That's one of the things that you can stop apoptosis you never die, you're starting to gain immortality. That's the transformative effect. So the on oncogenic activities of mu one like oscillation is lost, you can start losing the cell contact information. The extra membranous domain sheds, and that shedding actually allows interact the C terminal domain to go talk to all of its now receptor tires and kinases. It happens normally, but that ecto domain regulates the amount of interaction you can have. You lose the ecto domain. You can start talking with receptor tyrosine dynate, um, kinases. You can start down-regulating P53, the most important tumor suppressor gene. Activates NFP um, beta, NF kappa beta estrogen receptors, and in taxes, we're thinking with the estrogen receptor, this is one of the most useful cancer drugs in the liver. Um, the taxols. So we now have lost the ability to max the maximum in the taxols to talk to a liver capacity. So that was the situation. The yeah. terminal domain interacts with the extracellular matrix and adhesion proteins and will advance the ability for this thing to metastasize and invade. So this mucin, with it just being inherently glycosylated and overexpressed, is a huge component of the oncogenic potential. 
of the breast cancer cell. So if we take a cartoon image of what has to happen for an epithelial cell to progress to metastases, here's the polarized cell. We start losing polarity. We overexpress the mutants, mutants. Um, we start to get dysplasias with all sorts of non-polarized cell. We attack the basal membrane. We recruit capillaries by angiogenesis into the circulatory system with cells. OK, with all that background, we can now understand the article. The article is very, very, very little research. The article is a compilation of lots of information to ask the question, is the secreted ectodomain in the serum a useful marker for breast cancer? That's, so this is a compilation of lots of information to make the decision yes or no. So the assay which detects the soluble form is called CA153. So this is what we're thinking about. It is the most widely used serum marker for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. It's the best marker we have. Its main use is in monitoring therapy, and you're going to find out for those patients with metastatic disease. It is not useful for monitoring patients with primary cancers or local, local issues. The effort is to do a serial determination, meaning you measure the concentration of this assay at one time, then you measure it in three months, and then you measure it in three months, and you compare the data in order to make an evaluation as a diagnosis in recurrent or metastatic breast cancer. At the level of this, the time that this paper was written, one of the conclusions is going to be is unclear whether any of this has any indication of patient outcome. So this is the best marker at its time. And while we are going to see it is useful for monitoring the recurrence of metastatic disease, so far it is not correlated with patient outcome at the time of this particular issue. Of this particular article. OK, so um, levels are rarely increased. This is a limitation of this marker in patients with early or localized diseases. So this is not a first line marker or is there a breast cancer? It's got to be some other development to allow you to do that. Okay, you one in breast cancer. Um, in normal epithelial cells, it's on the apical plasma membrane and highly glycosylated. In the malignant cells, it's expressed at high levels on all membrane surface also found in the cytoplasm. So the dysregulation is at the level of gene transcription. So a signal transduct event, say turn this on, is one of the defects that's happening in the genetic cell. Changes in, there are changes in glycosylation. You have more glycosidic links, but you have less overall sugar. But it makes this more available to antibodies. Right? And there is an antibody good for MUP1. As a, um, as, a, as a biological therapy that was just approved a year or two ago. So this altered glycosylation is what's going to allow us to have let mute one, use one be a cancer marker. <clears throat> Here's the assay. The assay monitors the shed form. So nice, no biopsies, no surgery, we just need a blood sample. And the assay is an antibody assay. There are two flavors of antibodies. So there are monoclonal antibodies that have been raised to the membranes that would be enriched in use one um, for cancer cells and malignant cells. So the assays are of two flavors. There's a sandwich assay, which is this assay. You have one ass you have one antibody which is derivatized to the bottom of a of a test tube, and you flow your material over the serum, and if your protein binds to the antibody, you wash everything else away, you have an ectodomain sitting on your, on, on your vessel. You add a second antibody, and the antibody has been derivatized either with an enzyme or a fluorophore so that you can detect that that first antibody combination is there by fluorescence or an ELISA assay. assay and that's the one we use here. Um, there's information about what the two antibodies are and what the epitopes are. And so there's competitive ones where you use a single antibody and you bind your system to it and then you put 
use one purified that has been derivatized with a signal on it, and you compete off the non-bound form. You know how much fluorescence you had here. If you can put it on the antibody and compete it, the loss of fluorescence is what you competed off as mus one in the plasma. That's the assay that's used in this assay for the ovarian cancer, also is linked to a mus one phenotype. Okay, should CA153 be measured preoperatively in patients with breast cancer? Looking for primary, local, non-metastatic, and the answer is going to be no. All right, so the serum levels for breast cancer patients overlap those with healthy women. There's not enough discrimination between them, so there's no information for that, for that game. It's low sensitivity for low stage disease. And you can find CA153 concentrations associated with other diseases. Adro adrenocarcinomas and other benign diseases, so there's a lack of specificity for the antibody for breast cancer in those particular cases. So it is unuseful for that. And expert panels do not recommend that you even think about using this as a diagnosis for primary cancers. There is one expert panel that says, why not? It's cheap and easy. Let's get the data. I kind of like cheap and easy. I would get the data. Um, the next question was, are serial determinations time dependent? Treatment? Let's evaluate what's happening to this um, antigen at time after treatment. Is it useful for postoperative surveillance of asymptomatic patients, meaning um, following curative surgery? So. Here we've removed the tumor, we've had asymptomatic, let's do serial studies to see what's happening to this, um, to this marker. The goal is the earliest detection for recurrent and metastatic diseases that you can, the earliest detection means the earliest intervention. So that's the goal of this question. So invasive cancer treatments are diagnosis, they are the kinds of things we've talked about Follow-up surveillance, and follow-up surveillance is going to also include tumor marker measurement. So the data for this question, they disagree whether this is useful at the level of the data collected at the time of this paper. Um, but the marker analysis was not the same assay for each kind of analysis, and that was a critical point for this. If single patients, single markers, different assays, different data, so there was not a systematic effort, and that's, that's a conclusion for the, for the end of the paper. And the panels are, are influenced by two randomized trials, and here's the biggest problem. The trials were in the early 1990s, 20 years ago, using techniques that are nowhere near as sophisticated as the techniques that are available today. These trials said this was any marker, it was useless to predict recurrence or patient outcome. So this, these were huge trials, and one of the big conclusions from this manuscript is going to be those big trials need to be revisited to answer the questions within it. So now we have more sensitive um, imaging techniques. We have more sensitive. We have different hormone therapies. We have biological therapies. The conclusion is, all right, everybody's saying possible could be used, but there are no definitive statistical data to make a conclusion from has to be done. And who's willing to spend the time as a practicing physician to go find a thousand patients, collect all this data, and do this? That's that's the big problem. Someone needs to do this. So um, is it a value in monitoring patients with metastatic diseases? All right. So in an adjuvant situation, the goal of your therapy is cure. Okay. Primary cancer, cure them. In a static cancer, you're in a totally different situation. The goal is to evaluate tolerability and quality of life balanced with gains in disease regression and survival from the therapies. So this is a very, very, very different kind of question. So that if you have a therapy doesn't, that doesn't work, you need to know as soon as possible to stop the therapy try a different therapy. That's where the marker is going to be useful. So if the therapy is, is if the patient is responding and toxicity is acceptable, you continue. If it's not effective or you develop resistance, you stop and you try something else. So 
in this case, the panels recommend that you can use CA-15-3, but in conjunction, and this just makes sense, with other diagnostic imaging and hormone studies, receptor studies. So under these guidelines, it should be used for therapies to evaluate reoccurrence of metastatic disease. OK. Um, it should not be used alone, um, and it should be used in conjunction. There are also um, criteria set down by these experts of panels of when to say uh, the result is when to be significant, the result is not. So the article conclusions is that the marker is easy and cheap. Okay? But preoperative levels combined with prognostic factors are not useful for newly diagnosing cancers. So um, expert panels recommend for metastatic and reoccurrence a variable degree of confidence but that variable is correct. According to PubMed, 500 papers were published on this prior to this article and um, most of them are of low outcome and really should not impact. There are no data from large prospective trials correlating treatments and prognoses and outcomes. New trials need to be had. The main limitation to use in early disease is its lack of sensitivity for breast cell tumors. So in combination, this is recommended that it should be used. And this is the best marker at the time. Okay, so if you look at this, when I originally took this article, I thought that it was a 2013 article, and it's not. It's, it's a little old. And I would recommend in this journal club we stay within five years of the current time so that we stay with current literature. So I went ahead in the current literature once I realized that I got too deep into this and I wanted New, and the new information is the follow-up is this. So this is positron emission computed tomography. Positrons are antimatter. They are positive electrons. And there are isotopes which have positrons. And of course, that's going to be the only single signal you see in a body. So something with a positron, the background is going to go away. And you're going to have very, very sensitive resolution. So what people have done now is label glucose. Makes sense. Cancer cells need lots of glucose, and they uptake it much better than any other cell, even actively metabolizing some cells in your bodies. So what you do is you starve the patient, you feed them this labeled molecule for a couple of hours, you put them in the emission tomography machine, and you get this image. Wherever you see yellow, you see a cancer mass. This is severe metastasis. So this is the highest resolution, very quick, very expensive imaging technique. This person's in a lot of trouble. So the article I found was this article, a new study, 2014. You can't get much more current, but realize the 2014 article was submitted in 2013. We're already a year plus behind in the current information. And that's a lesson to our article. It was a little bit old. To make, and I haven't found anything that tries to do the same thing since. In this case, the result is C15-3 is a useful serum marker for diagnostic integration with this imaging technique. So this was 45, not 1,000 patients, a median of 60 years. If we think about, we'll talk about that for a second. The age range, 395 years, previous history of breast cancer and treated with surgery and other treatments. Relapse was detected in 16 patients. The antibody analysis and the positron analysis showed a 75% sensitivity correlation. That is really nice. Um, so the, in a specimen for um, 76 for C15-3 and 79 for PECT. So this indicates that um, a serial increase in CA15 can be used to predict positive imaging results. This is just the science outcomes. Um, and it also told that there was a significant increase in lead time from the, from the antibody analysis to even the positron analysis. So you could detect early, early, early. So this is a very, very, very useful study that suggests this is more useful than indicated by the original article. 
No, 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 no one's just done it. So the first article, in all fairness, agrees with this. It's, it's, it's not going to be useful for the primary tumor. It is useful, but cautiously, for the first article for looking at recurrence and getting some lead time for metastatic tumors. This one has a very high correlation with that. What really needs to be done is the highest resolution studies in a statistically relevant population. Statistic. My indications here are from this that we would use this simple, cheap enzyme assay to try to predict recurrence as early as possible by serial analysis. Okay, so um, the, the other thing, let's, let's relate this now to that patient who, um, who was our case history. The patient was 25 years old. <clears throat> in none of the work, and, and I'm not an expert in this field, I'm not following the literature all the time, this is really a crash course, get up to speed to where we are. <clears throat> I have not seen any age group studies of, of someone who is that young. So in this case, to relate this directly to that patient, I would still say this is probably term marker for metastasis, and that's the state she finds herself in. But there is, this is such a weird age group to have this particular phenomenon going on. The age groups you usually see are premenopausal and postmenopausal, with average ages of in the 30s and average ages in the late 40s. This is a very unique age population in that particular case study. So, let's complete questions. Okay, a little better feeling for what a tumor marker might be and how they might be useful. In this case, we're thinking about diagnoses. There will be tumor markers that are being attacked by antibodies, as we speak, as drugs or breast cancers. Joe? It's being used for ovarian cancer. It's, it's not as useful as a breast cancer marker. It's the same. It's actually the same ectodomain, but in this case, it's more useful for an ovarian cancer tissue. Josh? I don't understand it's good to have a baseline. Yeah. yeah, it's good to have a baseline, but but it's not useful for the primary tumor. There's there's not enough sensitivity, and there are other disease states that are correlated with a positive signal of CA153. So yes, the baseline material is always going to be necessary, but but in this case, it's it's just not useful as a diagnosis for the primary tumor. No, you've got to have a baseline. So, so right now, even the metastatic tumor, for that person starts a therapy, should be evaluated at CA153 levels to watch them decline if the therapy is being successful. So the baseline here is an elevated CA15 response if it exists. And you would evaluate the therapy decline. You would predict maybe instead of waiting until we see another tumor mass, we might change the therapy based on they, they did mention this. So, so there are some, there are spikes in, there have been observed spikes in CA3, 15, 3, a few days following initiation of the therapy. So the cells are always going to go, whoa, which is huge. <laughs> that hurt. And in this case, there can be, and there are observed a spike in the main. So you have to, It'd be nice to evaluate that, but then you have to do a second analysis at a time frame which is appropriate for the spike to be going down. Okay, let's let's cancel this. You just, you just stopped. No, we we can do this without the yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I I don't know. I don't. I, I can't speak to that. I don't know enough about every everything that's been done to make an evaluation. So thanks for coming today.
this is we're still online. Let's complete today's seminar. Let's forward to next one. Ciao.